I'm Dr. Larry Bruchette. I'm an ER doctor on the front lines of this coronavirus crisis. And I'm joined today by lawyer Suzanne Natbunny, who is a general counsel. Suzanne, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Larry. Suzanne, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you wanted to do this interview. So I am a business lawyer. I'm general counsel for a med spa, and I'm also uh, emphasized in healthcare law. I also have a startup company where we put out videos that help people with their legal issues. It's called Law Take. So as soon as the coronavirus pandemic hit, I was looking um, to connect with Larry to do a video about medical and legal issues based on my background. That's great. Where can people find this? Um, is it a website or where can people find the information that you're putting out there? Well, I am actually partner of Alliant law firm, alliantlaw.com, and uh, we put out articles on that website. And then I'm also, uh, I have my own firm, solveandwin.com. I put out some content there. And then lawtake, lawtake.com, short for Law Takeover, is the website where uh, we have a number of videos and documents that are either free or low cost to help people with their legal issue. And this video will eventually be uploaded either there or on the YouTube channel. Nice. Suzanne, you're a lawyer. Do you have any legal disclaimers you'd like to lead with? <laughs> of course. Please. Yes. Uh, this, the, obviously, the information in this video is, is just information. It's not advice. It doesn't represent any of the firms or entities that I practice for. And you should consult a lawyer about any decision you decide to make. I agree, and I want to echo the same thing for my profession as well. Just replace legal with medical. Suzanne, um, what have you been, so, so you do like business law, business stuff. What, what are you seeing these days? Like what are businesses and people coming to you with in, during the coronavirus pandemic? What's it like? Well, initially it was extremely busy because I still have clients that are working in essential businesses that are allowed to continue to operate. So a lot of questions as far as what to do about employees. Uh, there's all sorts of questions with um, concern about contracting the virus via client, their customers or clients and employees. And then um, so revising policies and procedures to have increased teleworking and also um, better equipment, new procedures if they are having to go to work or visit um, premises. So that was there was an, an onslaught of that as well as other businesses that have pivoted to enter into this space. Maybe they're um, changing from, you know, their, their real estate places are empty, so they're use, utilizing it to now sell uh, essential goods instead. So they've pivoted in terms of what they're doing and, you know, the legalities of that. Um, and so now it's a matter of getting back into business now that the orders hopefully will be listed soon and people can return to work. Give me, give me some examples. You talked about uh, employee issues. Give me some examples. One of the questions that we had for you was, suppose somebody is an essential worker and they, you know, have to go to work at the grocery store or whatever but they don't feel comfortable. They're worried that they're going to be at risk for getting coronavirus and they don't want to. Can they be fired? What are their rights? What can the business do? What, what are some of the kind of legal implications of all that? Well, first I want to mention that I am a business transactional lawyer, so I put a lot of policies and procedures in place to prevent disputes. I work with uh, my client and the other party to achieve win-win results in those contracts. So when clients come to me and they say this employment, this employee is having a problem, I'm not going to be quick to say, well, you can fire them. Um, I'm go litigators. They're more into, oh, you know, sue your employer if you have a problem or um, let's see where there's a lawsuit here. I am more interested in what does that person do? Um, how how essential are they to your business? Is there any way that you can offer them the, the paid time off that they're entitled to? There's many state and federal laws right now that enable people to take additional time off and they can use that. They can be furloughed. So really the business needs to make the, those financial decisions on what, whether, how important is that employee and what can they do with them. And then at the end of the day, 
if this person is maybe, you know, maybe working from home, but not producing um, like they, they should be, maybe, maybe they have distractions of childcare. Uh, the employer can continue to work with the employee, but at the end of the day, if the employee is an at-will employee, meaning that the employer can, or the employee can terminate at any time, the employer could terminate the employee as long as it's not for an illegal purpose, such as discrimination. Right. So, um, there, you know, many of my clients are working with their employees, trying to keep them on. Perhaps they have um, temporarily terminated them, planning on rehiring once the business is back open. But it is um, obviously a, a delicate situation when you have, um, you know, the employees may have child care issues. They may not want to get the virus because they're taking care of elderly people. So really try to work. With, I, I advise clients to avoid disputes and try to work with the employee if they can. Yeah, I like that perspective. I, I, I feel like I was expecting like you the kind of litigator thing where it's just I thought you were going to be. <laughs> I don't know what I thought you were going to say, but I like that, and it makes sense to me to to have a contract in place to prevent all of this stuff so that it kind of spells out. I mean, nobody you can't I can't imagine that in a lot of your contracts you had like, oh, if a viral pandemic should happen to you know, go all over the world, this is what happens in our business. Right. So it's not going to say that specific language of a pandemic, even if there's a force majeure clause in the contract. Um, w there are also employee contracts where you hire an employee for a certain term and then you can terminate them for cause. You may have seen that with one of your contracts if you've been an employee because you are with, I see that more frequently with physicians and nurses. So if you, some of the reasons for cause may be um, almost like a frustration of purpose argument. The, the, it, they cannot afford to sustain this business. And so they may utilize that clause if they needed to terminate an employee. But most people, again, are that I've seen with, with my practices are trying to work with their employees. It's not like people flat out trying to yeah. uh, get out of there. So um, it sounds like a lot of that is from kind of the, the employer or the business owner perspective. Tell me a little bit about what kind of rights that individual employees have in this time who may be worried that they are going to be fired or furloughed. If, if, is there anything they can do? Well, yeah, I, I do counsel some employees through this uh, a, a sort of transition process. Um, and if it seems like they, they were fired unlawfully, then I would refer that out. But during this process, it's important if you have a complaint, there should be uh, grievance procedures in the handbook. So you the employee would make that complaint. And so things need to be in writing. I asked for prote personal protective equipment and I was not provided anything. Um, I I asked to go home because I felt sick and I was told to stay at work. Certain things like that are not going to look good if you end up getting fired or if you want to terminate because your environment is uh, so uh, unstable to work in or, or risky to work in. God, I mean, you bring up that personal protective equipment, that PPE thing, and it just immediately touches that nerve in medicine where so many people on the front lines, nurses and doctors and therapists and so forth, feel like there really is inadequate PPE provided. And then people, doctors, I mean, I was when I was in New York, there was an ICU doctor, unfortunately, who was intubated in the ICU. He's an ICU doctor. And he got sick with coronavirus and he ultimately died. He was in his 60s. All of the residents and staff really loved him. And it was, it was really, really sad. But it that just made me think of that where it's like, gosh, could somebody have a case? Like it's a, that's a tough, that's a tough thing. That's a tough thing. Right. Uh, claims against the employer uh, for negligence um, in terms of the uh, conditions of work are something that I would refer out, but you, it would be fact specific to turn in the lawyer would determine and, or look for evidence that showed that, there was just complete uh, breakdown by the employer to provide, you know, OSHA standards, CDC guidelines. They sh they should be looking at those standards, and um, and I'm not sure how those lawsuits are going to come out. Um, but but I did want to actually ask you a question about that because I know that you just returned from um, New York, and I wanted to hear about your experience. I was wondering. It seems like it's night and day between New York and California. New York 
there's a lot of patients in the hospitals. They're at, what, from what I've heard, and I'd love to hear this from you, it's at full capacity versus in California, not so much. And I was curious what kind of deaths that you're seeing. Are they primarily uh, people with pre-existing conditions, elderly patients? Um, I hear you see a doctor who was um, in his 60s, so that is terrible. What what other things are you? What other types of um, people are you seeing? You know, you can you can talk about him. I understand he was in his 60s. He was he was a big man, 300 pounds, so pretty obese. Once you get on a ventilator, obesity makes that even more complicated. He was not young and healthy, unfortunately. I think most of the critically ill and deaths are in people that are old, meaning over 65, and it increases with age, and then have chronic medical conditions. Somebody who's had diabetes their whole life and has disease all over their arteries from that, including kidney failure, for example, and is already on dialysis, you know, they're sick if they're old and they get coronavirus and they end up ventilated, it's impossible to get them off. I mean, that's super high chance those guys aren't going to make it. We had a 20-something-year-old patient who ended up getting the virus in her heart. We call that myocarditis. She did okay. She survived. She was discharged. She needs to follow up, but she was better. Really didn't see very many young, health. That was it. She was the only one I had under 40. I had a guy in his 40s, but he had bad diabetes, and he ended up doing well and surviving. You know, I had an 80-something-year-old um, patient with dementia. She didn't make it. Um, in general, it, it really, in my, in my experience, and what, it, what I think the whole world has um, showed with research is it, it is much greater risk of dying for the folks that are older and sick, which, to put that in perspective, means if you're younger and healthier, don't freak out about it. But it does mean take it seriously so that you aren't part of what gets older, sicker people um, coronavirus and ultimately kills them. You know, I think we all have this duty to protect the weak among us. And um, that was really impressed upon me going there. Yeah. Yes, actually, I've heard about some younger people who have um, passed away from the coronavirus. And I was curious um, if there was any types of trend by, you know, something where maybe they are, they, they don't get medical care soon enough or they don't have health insurance and um, they did not have an early intervention. Is there something that, that you've seen in terms of the data and science um, surrounding why maybe some younger people have not made it? And then also, is there negligence in the, have you seen negligence in the, um, or heard of it? You know, you may not want to speak for yourself, but if you've heard of any in the hospitals where maybe these younger people weren't given the attention because they were younger, I, I'm not sure myself. No, that's not the case. I, I think when you hear about, it's going to be, I would say it's rare that a truly young, healthy person, again, with medical access, um, is going to succumb to this. But, but young people die of the flu. These aren't the same. They're two totally different things. But I would still say that it's rare for a young, healthy person. Um, when it happens, it's more likely that they're 30 years old and 300 pounds with diabetes. It's more likely that they're, you know, 20-something. And, like, a lot of our service, you know, you can't forget all of these other things that matter with people's health. There's a lot of drugs and alcohol. Alcoholics, that's an increased risk. Not just typical medical stuff like diabetes, smoking, vaping. If you vape, stop. If you, st if you smoke, now is a great time to stop because if you're young and healthy, that increases your risk. And right now during this thing, it's foolish. Um, but then also, something that you have to talk about is you have to talk about the socioeconomic stuff. Poverty, access, not just, you know, insurance doesn't mean access but actually being able to get the care, meaning the medication, the supportive care, a ventilator. And it's very different in a county setting in New York versus New York Presbyterian or NYU, places where there's money. 
Cedars Sinai in LA is going to be a different standard of care than you know a, a hospital with a lot of homeless folks. So and and so money matters. Sorry, I got to it's this coronavirus in my eye. I'm kidding, Suzanne. Um, okay, I'm going to probably cough at some point, so right. I'll just run out of, the, out of the room. But these other things that matter, too, you know, money matters, poverty matters, the kind of you know environment that you're living in matters. Race matters. You look at these stats where, whatever it is, 15 or 20 percent of Louisiana is black, but double that 50 60 percent of the deaths from coronavirus are in black people that kind of disproportionate thing you kind of start asking these questions and i think part of the answer is unfortunately the system is still has a lot of racism in it so there's a lot of reasons beside there you know all of this coronavirus is just kind of opening up and and um putting on display a lot of the disparities that are in medicine every day anyway you know it's just becoming very stark if you're willing to look at it it's a real but it's a real thing for sure i have just uh, a couple of follow-up questions um so what about the blood clots that are, and strokes that i've heard in young people do you have any information on what's going on with that yeah coronavirus is a very very bizarre disease something that i've never really seen anything quite like it let me contrast it with the flu. When somebody gets the flu, people know the flu, you get sick, you get kind of body aches, fevers, you feel tired, maybe you have a sore throat and a cough, feel pretty terrible for a few days, it goes away. When people get complications of the flu, it's usually pneumonia, meaning the flu virus kind of weakens you a little bit, and pneumonia is a bacterial infection in your lungs. So the bacterial infection comes on top of the flu, and a lot of people end up dying from pneumonia. Now, we're going to get into, Suzanne, um, this cause of death thing. I know that was something that you wanted to talk about and kind of these stats and stuff. And I want to show you this cause of death form, which is very confusing and I think is part of the problem with this whole thing. But So it's like, was, well, what did they die of? If somebody gets the flu, but they die of pneumonia, do you say that they died of the flu? Or do you say that they died of pneumonia? Um, it's kind of both, right? Like if they didn't get the flu, they wouldn't have got pneumonia, but it was probably pneumonia that killed them. And so more people, when people die with the flu, they die of pneumonia more of the time than they actually directly die of the flu. That's, pneumo that's the flu. With coronavirus, in the same way, people get coronavirus. And before I went to New York, I thought, Oh, it's primarily attacking their lungs, causing respiratory failure, putting people on ventilators, right? The breathing machine. And then we're all worried. We're going to run out of vents and ICU beds, mainly to support people's breathing. But what I saw was, number one, was kidney failure. And I thought, I've never seen a flu patient with kidney failure. So rare. So many of these coronavirus patients had kidney failure. And it's like, well, why does that happen? And there's two kind of ideas, and this is, we're very new in getting to know this, so in three or six months, this may totally change. But there's this idea that you get the virus, you get coronavirus, you're, you, when the virus is replicating, it's going through your body, that's not what kills people. It's your body's immune system reaction to that virus a week or two later. People call this a cytokine storm. Cytokines are one immune system mediator type of uh, uh, that part of the immune system that basically the thought is that it overreacts and that that actually leads to the damage as opposed to directly from the virus. That's one idea. And hmm. the other, and they may be related. And the other idea is this idea of tiny clots. Somehow the virus causes the body to have these tiny clots everywhere and that the clots actually cause things like kidney failure, like strokes, like clots in your leg, which is called DVT, and clots in your lung, which is called pulmonary embolus. It's very bizarre. I've never taken care of people that have clots in their lungs and legs, kidney failure, respiratory failure, pneumonia, stroke, like 
I've never seen anything that can cause all of that. It's a very unique, it's very unique, number one, in my experience. And then two, pretty deadly. You know, it's pretty worrisome, again, for the weak, for the sick and the older. Um, so coronavirus is unique in that sense, and it, it really doesn't just get your lungs. There's a lot of other ways. And so if somebody, you know, is like, has borderline kidneys to begin with, and then they get that, it's like a double whammy. It often hits the lungs, but then it takes out the kidneys. And then it's like you've got, instead of just one big log on your back, it's like you got two. And then what if you get another clot? And then what if your heart gets involved? And it's just, it's too much. The place I was working at, I don't want to keep talking about this, Suzanne. I'm going to ask you some questions because we're here because I want to get this audience to get some stuff from you too. But, but, I, but I'll say this. When I was in this place in New York, it had surged two or three weeks before I was there. And one of the main reasons that they said people were dying, they didn't run out of vents. They ran out of the ability to do dialysis for kidney failure because the dialysis nurses got sick. And mm. that was one of the ways that patients died. And in large numbers in the beginning was that was the capacity that they weren't able to, which we normally, somebody needs dialysis, you can give it to them. Hopefully it's temporary. Their kidneys recover and they don't need it forever. Some people end up needing it forever. But you can survive without your kidneys by getting dialysis where your blood's filtered. But they didn't have the ability to do that, and people died. The um, nurses were uh, contracting COVID? That's what I was, why what I was told was the nurses got COVID, and they were sick, and they went home, and there were not enough nurses to do dialysis. It's a specific kind of nurse, not any nurse. Right. You know, you have to run the machine, and they're kind of the specialists that run the dialysis machine. So that's very, that was very unique, and that was unexpected. I didn't, I thought they were going to run out of vents, not dialysis. That was kind of interesting. Thank um, you. So, I mean, there's a, a lot of, there's a lot of questions that I'm kind of like, I wonder what Suzanne would say. Like, so here's a question along those lines. And if you don't know these things, don't just, you could just say you don't um, know it. But when I went there, um, and I volunteered, they said, Cuomo has suspended, there, there can be no malpractice for this period of time during, you know, the disaster where they were calling for volunteers to come in. And then as, the, as I was going to the end, kind of the chief medical officer was going around, he's saying, hey, things are going back to normal. Not like, oh, quit screwing around, but it's like, no, now we need to be extra careful and with documentation and whatever to kind of things go back to the normal kind of medical legal heightened fears and whatever. I'm curious, like what's the legal basis for being able to suspend malpractice? How does that play out? And So I did talk to a friend, Josh Bloom, who's a New York attorney, and I wanted to confer with him about your, your question regarding Cuomo's order. And um, from my understanding, it well, first of all, the state, your program must have given you permission to practice outside of California. And assuming we're in the middle of pandemic, then you got, I'm not sure if you're in New York. So, I thought you were in so California. So I don't, yeah, I don't, I didn't have a, Cal, I only have a California license. I don't right. have a New York license. They did kind of emergency privileges right. and they verified right. my license in California and that was good enough for this. Okay, so that, that's, that's the first thing. And then now, let's say a patient died and they have a, a clever plaintiff's lawyer um, who is going to be going after, for sure, the hospital and then anybody else they can tack on. So that would be the individual doctor. Right. And um, so the defense would be, because I saw the order, it doesn't mean they can't sue you. They're, you're, you would have immunity if you were within this 30-day period of practicing and you exercised only negligence, not gross negligence, which is much more egregious conduct. So really that, bad, doing terrible. something really bad. Yes, you. You know the the law school example is like leaving a surgical tool inside the patient or operating on the wrong arm, something like that. Right. So um, now that clever plaintiff's lawyer is going to say it was gross negligence. They're going to make that argument. So they're going to try to get around that. And it doesn't just completely insulate you from from liability. It's just your it's just your defense, and it should be 
hopefully handled by the hospital's insurance or your own. Yeah. So you may get into a, a big thing. I didn't see your contract that you signed. This yeah. is something that I would have negotiated. I would have made sure there's insurance coverage. That's either, you know, my client has it, you know, the extension to go to another state to practice, which I, I think it'd be better for that hospital to include you in the coverage, obviously. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, right. Um, so let me ask you just a little more about um, this because this, this came up was, um, and I talked to um, this ICU doctor in New York and we were talking a lot about end of life decisions. Sometimes families want everything done, which could mean leaving somebody on a ventilator for a long time who really isn't going to have any chance at meaningful recovery versus um, an ICU doctor, for example, who doesn't want to do CPR as a patient is dying because it's medically futile. It's not going to make a difference. The patient's going to die anyway. So you have this dilemma on the one hand between kind of medical futility and a doctor saying, no, this really isn't medically necessary or beneficial versus, you know, the patient's kind of stated wishes or the wishes of the durable power of attorney, the family member that makes that decision. I saw a lot of the tension with that. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that particular dilemma. So most of my clients have small medical practices. Um, most of my clients are small businesses. They're not hospitals. I would think that the hospital policies would have to deal with, would have to outline what goes on in, ter in that situation. Um, and the protocol would need to be followed because otherwise you've got the wrongful death actions, which again, I'm not a part of, I've heard of them going on. And, um, I've, I've, I've already heard of them going out. People have call, contacted me. I've referred them to lawyers to handle that. It's not my area. R so, wrongful death meaning what? Well, um, the ne negligence of the hospital or the, the facility or doctor um, in terms of handling the patient. So, so this person did not pass away of natural causes. They passed away because there was a failure on some part of the medical care. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting, I mean, we had some kind of conversations about it. The, the defense of medical futility, it's a dilemma. I mean, you, you never want to abandon the patient or their wishes, but then on the other side, you don't want to torture them at the end of their life either for something that isn't going to help them to live longer or recover. Yeah, they're going to look at the standard of care. You know, what, what's the proper standard of care? Was that followed? Well, and then the standard of care, too, in the middle of a, of, of a pandemic where mm -hmm. so many people are dying and you don't, I mean, how does, how does the hospital's capacity change that? I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. We had a patient who um, was kind of full code, do everything, and they suddenly got worse from a respiratory standpoint. We had to put them on a ventilator and then she stabilized and... The patient was unable to go to the ICU because the ICU was full. And so they got care on the floor by a nurse who was doing her best, and I think she was doing a great job, but wasn't an ICU nurse. Didn't have all of the, you know, monitors and buttons and, and experience. And so it's like, what do you do in that circumstance where the capacity of the hospital is maxed out? How does that factor in on a in a potential lawsuit, you know? This is something that they would tender to their insurance, which is um, important for me to bring up because that's been also occurring right now, is uh, do, you know, do companies have proper insurance for coronavirus issues that are, I mean, there's gonna be so much litigation, the, co the courts are just gonna be so flooded. Um, and so having, um, you know, whether you have business interruption insurance or even, you know, we're in L.A., so the entertainment industry, production insurance for coronavirus issues, mm. there's an outbreak. Um, so, yeah, it's a good time to look at your insurance policy policies, um, make sure that you have good CGL, commercial general liability. There's, you know, officers and directors policies, DNO um, for, you know, maybe they're making bad decisions with regards to 
um, increasing the budget to provide more personal protective equipment um, and other more staff if they're you know they're going to look at all of these things and so yeah. it's, it's going to be pretty messy with litigation and, and increasing uh, insurance policies probably. Suzanne, what are some of the to you kind of the more interesting things that you think are going to make it to the court in this time in terms of litigation? I mean, you just said, like, things are going to, oh, my gosh, so many things are going to go to the court. I'm like, like what? Like, what interests you? What what things do you think are going to? Yeah. Um, well, so I'll just step, take a step back and just, again, say my, my role is usually to put out disputes. So the, when I say the, case, the courts are flooded, they weren't, you couldn't even file um, for a, a while. I think that was just lifted in New York today. My colleague told me, um, California, there's e-filing, but uh, whether or not you could submit motions was another story. All hearings have been pushed back. So it really pushes people to try to settle. And mm -hmm. I try to, um, I have a video on um, legal issues, you know, when it comes to whether you have a lawsuit. And I'm always telling my clients, you know, look at your claims, look at your corroboration. Do you have evidence? Um, can you continue to communicate with the other party to try to resolve this? Look for a compromise. And you know what? What's your compensability? What are your damages? How much money is at stake? Um, and so I, I is put it that worth it? it? Yeah, it's worth it. Yeah, at the end of the day, it may not be because um, you could have resolved this sooner and moved on to greener pastures. Sometimes it is because you may have a good case. You may, you know, may have a lawyer who thinks you have a good case. I have definitely heard about um, uh, events you know, concerts, sporting events, not giving proper refunds. The, the class action lawyers are over all over that. Um, price gouging issues. Crazy, right? Yeah. I mean, you could get fines from the city for that, you know, increasing the price of hand sanitizer, anything more than 10%. Um, you're not allowed to do that during times of a pandemic or an emergency. Um, I've seen well, it's like you're not allowed to do it, but like, who's going to stop you? You just said it like the courts aren't even taking like these guys are so overwhelmed. People are going to get away with stuff. Well, there, there's the court system to resolve civil civil issues, and then you have the government that goes after you know that's in charge of overseeing some of these rules. So they will issue fines. They may, yeah. So the feds. Uh, the feds, yes, exactly. You may get a fine. Um, the Department of Consumer Affairs is looking out for the price gouging issue. Um, and, you know, people, but it, it, I deal with mostly contracts. So when, when a contract is breached right now, it's a lot of back and forth between the other parties, lawyer, and trying to work out a settlement. Yeah. Negotiating, um, yes, trying to get a settlement, whether it's coronavirus related or not. It's uh, something you do, I mean, because maybe businesses right now, um, they just, they're, they're moving on to other things. They have to change things around. And so they, they don't either want to pay or they don't want to provide the service. So I'm dealing with contract issues on whether or not people can get out of them or helping my clients with that. Suzanne, you were, you and I spoke a little bit before. Tell me about some of the businesses that you work with. You said restaurants, gyms, these guys have rent they have to pay. What are their options now? What are they doing what tell me tell me about your experience with them in this time because they don't have any money coming in. Right. Well, I also told clients to um, try to get the SBA loans that the disaster relief and the um, SBA CARES Act provided the PPP loan. So I was trying to help my clients with some of that. Um, and then if that money, uh, if even if that money came in, it, some of it was supposed to go to payroll versus paying rent. So with the landlord situation in LA, because a lot of my clients are in LA, and I've been specifically retained to work on this for several clients, but um, Garcetti issued an order, um, which is now an ordinance that says that basically you have uh, three months from after the end of the state of emergency to pay your rent to the landlord. It does not mean that you don't have to pay it. It just means that if you're supposed to pay 5,000 a month, and this goes on for let's say five months, then you're going to have to pay twenty five thousand dollars one you know before the end of when this is uh, um, the ordinance ends. So um, whether or not you choose to take that aggressive stance with your landlord is one is 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 on you know one issue to consider. Another is um, whether or not you you have the financial capability of actually paying rent. So uh, 
Garcetti in the order, it says that if this has to be because you don't have the financial means. This can't be for a business that has a ton of money in the bank because you're going to have to show the financials to your landlord. Yeah. So um, you may want to work with the landlord. And I've, I'm dealing with this right now. We're going back and forth with, you know, the landlord is pushing for all of, the, you know, the landlord's being aggressive. And we're being, you know, in responsive to that, being aggressive. Or they just agree. I've had some clients where they don't even have to. The landlord is serious, actually said, it's okay. You don't have to pay your rent for these two months that you were closed. And we get that in writing, of course. So it can be across the board, but at the end of the day, if the landlord decides to um, bring an unlawful detainer action, which is the action to evict, which can still happen, even if you think you have no financial means to pay rent, um, then your defense would be that Garcetti's order, you have financial problems, coronavirus, and that's why you haven't paid. You can't be charged a penalty for paying late by the landlord. That's what it says. And it can't go on your credit report. So... You know, depending on whether I represent... But it's not, it isn't, oh, you don't have to pay June rent. You don't have to pay May rent. You're saying the order from the mayor of Los Angeles, or the city of Los Angeles, is just, oh, if you can't pay it now, you can pay it later. And if you pay later, there's no fee and it doesn't ding your credit report. That's what you're saying that order says. It doesn't, right. like, absolve you from paying rent for a month or two. No, exactly. And again, it's all negotiable. So if you take a tough stance now, maybe when it comes to renew, it, your landlord will not want to work with you. So there's a lot of things to consider. Every lease, you know, you, your lease may have provisions. I doubt that it has anything about a force majeure clause, you know, absolving the tenant of having to pay rent. But um, you and, would. And wait a minute, wait a minute. Say that that legal term again for yeah. like the world is ending viral pandemic. What was that forced measure clause? Is that what you said? Yes, the forced measure clause. It excuses the, the for the force measure. Measure. I think it's French. Yeah, measure, yes. Measure. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> so what is it? Force measure, what does it mean? It is basically a clause in a contract that excuses performance. It means that there's a major event like a strike or an act of God. Right. And you know, because of that, you cannot perform, and then you would have to show why you could not perform. I don't have, have to pay rent because of an act of God, or I don't have to work, or it just gets you out of it because of an act of God. That's not likely in your lease, but it could be in a uh, <laughs> in one of your contracts to provide services. So um, it's in a lot of it's in my clients' gen my clients' service contracts contain it. That's for sure. And in, in most of my clients, uh, most of my contracts are meant to be fair. So it, yeah. it can excuse both parties. Um, why, by having a fair contract from the beginning, you reduce the negotiation of back and forth legal time. So, um, you know, it's just it, it depends on every client's situation. How are you how has your contracts like moving forward? Are you going to include that in your future contracts? How have your contracts you know, changed because of this. Yeah, I've had a lot of clients who have a lot of contracts that need to be revised and we're working within their legal budget. So it's not just contracts, but it's like the policies, all new policies going forward. Um, the standard force majeure clause kind of contains um, like a catch-all where they can maybe, you know, inc probably include a, an emergency order or pan pandemic. But then even if the other party were to say no, it, it doesn't include that. You would still have other contract defenses, such as uh, frustration of purpose. The, the purpose of this contract is frustrated by what's going on. You have the, the defense of impossibility of performance, so, or you know, the claim of it. So you would basically say, it's, it's impossible for me to perform because the, we're in a shutdown. We're at a safer at home order. I can't provide this service. Yeah. Um, even illegality is another potential claim. So. There's all sorts of, um, you know, contract claims and defenses that you would include if you're trying to get in, you know, in or out of a contract. Suzanne, do you find that most people, meaning on both sides of this negotiation, are like reasonable good people who try to work things out? <laughs> um, well, I... Tell me about that <laughs> laugh. Oh, I just, I, I can't help but laugh because sometimes you have really, you, a lot of times you have at least four factors on whether or not people are reasonable because you have <laughs> me, the lawyer on one side, my client, 
And then you have the lawyer on the other side who could be crazy. And then you have the client <laughs> on the other side who could also be crazy or one of the two. Wow. So I, I would say most of my clients are not, of course. Um, but I, I just laugh because, um, you know, you have to make fun of, of you have to laughing is, is a good thing to get out of your job and when you can, when you're handling, you know, real big, you know, serious issues, because I'm telling you when, usually when it's somebody crazy, sadly, it's, uh, it, it's really hard for your client or, you know, for the case to basically settle or the deal to go through, but mostly it, they are reasonable. Kind of sounds that way. Yeah. It made me feel a little better, but certainly. Yeah. Uh, people like to use the, the legal system to aggressively get what they want, whether it's reasonable or not. Um, okay, Suzanne, I want to talk about this cause of death business. Yes, I wanted to ask you about that. Why don't you ask me about it, and I'm going to see if I can share the screen with everybody and show a death certificate, and I want to walk you and these folks through, through it to kind of explain my answer. But what's your, what was your question around it? Well, we talked about, you know, who is actually dying. Um, I, you know, we talked about whether or not people, I was curious whether um, there's an incentive in hospitals to classify deaths as COVID versus another cause. And um, whether or not, you know, when you're filling out that form, as far as, um, when you like you were talking about pneumonia or flu how does that get filled out how do you make that determination yeah. when you're filling out the forms because this is a lot of people are watching the numbers on the news the news is sensationalizing yep. um how many people are dying and so yeah. are these numbers skewed that's what i wanted to talk about yeah. you're going to show me the form you know I, I mean i've filled out countless um death certificates in my career i've never had anybody ever tell me hey, we want to pad these numbers. Why don't you, you need to put more COVID on there. It just, at least in the hospitals and the places I've worked at, that's just not really a thing. To be honest, the the death form, the the certificate of death, it's a pain in the ass. Um, it's, it's, it's just another piece of, like, what do we care about? Yeah. We take care, we care about taking care of patients and doing the right thing and by them and their families and doing all that stuff. Paper, this is just a piece of paper. Um, and it, it, as such, it's just not very valued. Um, let me show you this death certificate. Maybe you can understand why, why I hate filling these things out. I try to get out of it at every opportunity. Um, well, you're talking to a lawyer who's a paper pusher, so <laughs> I'm I'll glad try. There are people I'll, like you to do yeah, that I'll paperwork. Try, I'll try to be empathetic, though. I'm sorry that you're having to fill that out. I don't think you're sorry. Um, I'd rather you focus on care too, for real. Wait a minute. Have I been sharing my screen the whole time? Oh no. That's going to make me cry. Okay, so let me pull up. Um, so this is a death certificate. I think it's showing up on the thing. I'm going to trust that it is. This is going to be an interesting interview if this whole thing. Let me just push this button and see what happens. What do you see right now, Suzanne? see me have, <laughs> and you, been, then have I, you been seeing I, you the whole time um well i see me now not not the whole time but i've been i've been seeing you and i see the death certificate it's on the screen behind me now you see that now i see that currently okay you see now i see now i see the death certificate okay all right good yeah so let's do this death certificate thing so yeah, i'm gonna man. so this is this is kind of a it says u.s standard certificate of death i'm gonna make it bigger so we can kind of actually read it. Excuse the, this is like the best one I could find on the internet and at the last minute, but this is kind of what these things look like. U.S. Standard Certificate of Death. All this stuff is just information on the patient. This is what I want to zoom in on and talk about. Cause of death, okay? There's three different things here, okay? Number one is over here. This is immediate cause of death. Final disease or condition resulting in death. This is probably the best answer not the best answer. This is where this gets confusing. This is what the patient died of. So a lot of times here, I'll put cardiac arrest, respiratory arrest, the heart stopped beating. It's kind of like, duh. That's almost synonymous with death, okay? Underneath this, 
It says sequentially list conditions leading to this immediate cause of death and ultimately resulting in this last one, which is the underlying cause of death. So, so let me give you kind of a more clear example. The immediate cause of death, you could say, let's take the flu for example. You could say pneumonia here, or you could say respiratory failure. Both are probably true. The underlying cause of death, you might put influenza down there. The flu led to, so it would go like this. Respiratory failure would be the first line. That's the immediate cause. Respiratory failure from what? From influenza. Influ or, I'm sorry. Respiratory failure from what? Pneumonia. Bacterial inflection in the lungs. Well, pneumonia from what? from influenza. So you might call the underlying cause of death influenza and the immediate cause respiratory failure. Does that make sense? Yes. So okay. and got then, it. let me say one other let me say one other thing and then we'll get your question. Part two is this says enter other significant conditions contributing to death but not resulting in the underlying cause given in part two. That's a little confusing but let me give you the example. So if we're going to say the immediate cause of death is respiratory failure from pneumonia, from the flu, something else that would matter is if they were a smoker their whole life and had emphysema, right? So in this case, they didn't actually die from the emphysema. It was the flu that led to pneumonia, that led to their respiratory failure. But that mattered. Their emphysema and their smoking their whole life certainly mattered and put them at risk. So in these days, with this coronavirus, I was talking about kidney failure earlier, and a lot of people died from kidney failure. There's four ways that you could die from kidney failure. Acidosis, high potassium, which we call hyperkalemia, um, fluid overload, uh, or, um, oh, I'm forgetting the fourth one, uremia, which is a kind of a high-level toxin that causes altered mental status. Again, you could do the same thing. Immediate cause of death, you know, cardiac arrest from high potassium caused by kidney failure, which was in turn caused by the underlying cause, which would be COVID-19 or coronavirus. So really, coronavirus probably belongs on this underlying cause down here on D, C or D. Mm -hmm. The immediate cause being they died of a stroke, or a clot, a clot in their lungs, or kidney failure, or respiratory failure, ultimately from coronavirus. And then these other medical conditions are everything that you hear about. Alzheimer's, bad diabetes, pre-existing heart disease. All these things put people at risk of dying from coronavirus from some other immediate cause. Does that make sense? Yes. So I wanted to ask you about this, and I'm glad you were explaining where coronavirus would go on this, because um, this, you know, recently there was a YouTube video that was taken down by Dr. Erickson and his partner who have an urgent care in Bakersfield. And um, they seem to make some claims in that video that was then um, criticized by the emergency medical um, academies and I was curious why what what are your thoughts being that you're also you've now worked in Bakersfield in the ER you've worked yeah I know you've worked all over the state in various ERs and now you've worked in New York so um these what are you these think? guys yeah that's them this is uh, uh Dan Erickson, Artin Masihi these guys own five urgent cares in Bakersfield accelerated urgent care I will disclose a conflict of interest. I oh. uh, am a partial owner of an uh, um, ER group, and we have two ERs in Bakersfield. It's not going to affect anything that I say about this, but I think these guys are out of line, but I just want to disclose that, and I've worked in Bakersfield for a couple of few years. I don't know these men personally, but I am certainly aware of this story that you're t telling. You know, these guys made this YouTube video that blew up and got millions and millions of followers. And they basically were like, look, we've done thousands of uh, coronavirus tests 
and we're not impressed. The, we think the death rate is super, super low. We think it's 0.02%. We think it's far lower than China, than Fauci, than anybody is saying. We think this is overblown and people should go back to work. Look at the huge hit on the economy. Look how it's affecting medical practices and hospitals and urgent cares like the five that they own, despite running all those corona tests. Based on our numbers, this is why we think it is what it is. Um, it should be obvious. And it's really funny. You watch that video and, you know, the guy, this guy here, he's like, look, I had a public health class in medical school. I had immunology. And it's like, bro, you had one month of a public health class. You know, like we did take immunology over whatever, a couple months, like, you are not a master's in public health. I don't think either of these guys have a master's in public health. I may be wrong. I don't think so. You're not a PhD in epidemiology. You're not Fauci. You guys own urgent cares. That's number one. This is a credibility issue. And these guys, they're, cre they, they're former ER doctors. They're not practicing ER anymore. They're urgent care owners. I don't even know if they practice. Their sphere is urgent care, right? It's not population-based health for the entire country. That really matters. They should not be on this platform, right? Um, you got to take that with a grain of salt. They're going to be experts at telling you how to treat strep throat at an urgent care and how to set up the business and all of that. For them to say, you know, we have this five or six thousand dollars, five or six thousand tests we've run or whatever it is, these are our numbers, therefore let's open up the whole country. It should be very obvious that that's a very regional, localized population of, don't forget, a certain kind of patient is going to go to the urgent care, and they're not the sickest. The sickest are going to come to us in the ER, right? So of course their numbers are going to be, you know, they're going to have less positive cases, those people aren't going to be as sick. They're not going to be as impressed with the numbers. For them to make the statements that they made just based on their numbers is so incredibly foolish and terrible science. It's really embarrassing. It's embarrassing. They certainly hit a nerve with a lot of people that are pissed and ready to go back to work and are sit or stay at home. And they're wondering, especially in California, where we haven't seen in California all of the bad surge and death in New York, it's we're wondering, is this even necessary? That's a fair question. I think that's a very fair question for people to ask. And the answer is, thank God it's that way, that we had good leadership and people, good government leadership, knew some London Breed, mayor of San Francisco. They did the right thing, science-based, and people listened. You know, both deserve that credit. Thank God that's what happened. But to suggest that somehow this is not that dangerous and we should open things up for the sake of the economy is absolutely wrong and I strongly disagree. And after seeing what I saw in New York City, this attitude which is running around the country is terrifying. People, this will lead to dead people without a question. People will die because of this attitude. And so here's the question to you, Suzanne. You get something like this that goes viral on YouTube where these guys, seemingly credible doctors who are very persuasive in this video, say, look guys, it's not that bad. Look at our numbers in Bakersfield, urgent care numbers, okay? Very skewed uh, sampling, right? That's just sample bias is what that is. Very, very easy to see this. Hey. We, based on our numbers, we don't think this thing's that bad. We should open things up because look at all the economic suffering. You know, they say that. That goes viral. Holy cow, that's going to... Like, from my perspective, I'm like, people are going to die because of that video. Without a doubt. There will be dead... I don't know how many, but people will die because of that video. Somebody's going to... handful of people are going to not listen or going to go out or going to go back to whatever. And mm. so the question is... I don't think there's any question medically that what they said is just flat out wrong and terrible medical advice. The American Board of Emergency Medicine came up. I'm going to zoom in on what their exact statement was, and they um, shot it down. 
American, American College Emergency Physicians emphatically condemn the opinions released by Erickson and Masihi. Reckless, untested musings do not speak for medical societies and are inconsistent with current science and epidemiology regarding COVID-19. As owner of local, local urgent care clinics, it appears these two individuals are releasing biased, non-peer-reviewed data to advance their personal financial interests personal financial interests without regard for the public's health. I completely agree with that, 100%. It really looks like these guys, by doing that, are trying to open up their urgent care and uh, benefit from that again. Um, I'm trying to jump back to me. Am I screwing it up? What do you see, Susan? I don't see you. I, I see, yeah, there's, there's me and you. I agree with that. It really looks like these guys are saying this to um, to open up their urgent care because they they want to open them up again. I think that's absolutely part of it. Anyway, the question is: Let's just assume that you know them doing this um, could result in. Uh, people dying. Should YouTube take it down? Should you have the freedom of speech to to release something that is probably going to lead to behaviors that are going to kill people? It's a great dilemma. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. I mean, I strongly disagree medically with what they said, and I think they were out of line. Do I think it should be censored or taken down? I really uh worry about the negative, deadly effect it could have, and it makes me think about it. What do you think? So if they had come to me before they had posted that video, I would have, a lot of clients come to me, they tell me what the thing is about, they do not have me, they do not want to pay me by the hour to review all the content. I'll tell you that right now, whether it's a video or a book or sometimes they do. But, because um, I think the first video was an hour and then the second one was a lot shorter. I did not watch the first video, but, yeah. um, so it needed to have the proper disclaimers on it and they needed to um so one of the one of the things right now that's going on that's concerning to me is there there's a lot of fake news okay there's a lot of uh, disputed numbers i can't tell you how many different times i've heard different figures of how many um uh how many deaths there were of the flu in this season of 2017 to 2018 okay i've heard um, everywhere from like 40,000 to 80,000 and then people are comparing that to the coronavirus. So I, um, you know, how many deaths that we've had so far. So what, so when I think about, you know, what is valid, what is scientific, I think back to what, um, you know, the court of law, what is the court of law except into evidence? It has to be science-based. It has to be, there's called the Dauber test and it, you what know, it's say that again. Dauber test. Okay. Another you, French word. Yeah, I think. I think I'm pronouncing that right. I don't really, again, this is more litigators who deal with it. Yeah. But I remember I wrote a term paper in law school about putting, um, utilizing complementary and alternative medicine, which is on the fringe. I'm a big, you may not agree with it, but I'm a big, you know, believer in um, preventive medicine. And um, it's I not. I absolutely believe in preventive medicine. Yay! Preventive. Okay, it's not necessarily. But I have a lot of problems with alternative medicine and, and a lot of the nonsense that's sold. Continue. Right, Carry on, right. Susan. So, well, Carry so on. do I. And that's why um, I would like to see things being valid and reliable and peer reviewed. And so you can get a lot of the crap out of there. That's the way I see it. And um, I totally agree. Right. So, but the problem with the coronavirus now is that we only have a few months of data. How long does it, so, so for me to tell them and say, have you gotten this, have you submitted your science to a journal to get it peer reviewed? I mean, obviously no they may, they, they, of course they made it, they would have said, we don't want it. We want us, we want to put this video up. So I would have said it needs to have disclaimers before, maybe on the bottom at the end. And they need to um, be, you know, they probably should have, a, not made such sweeping conclusions because I thought the same thing when I originally saw the second video was how are they, you know, this is Bakersfield and I understand that it, like, I've never been to Bakersfield. I've heard you talk about it. I've heard other friends talk about it. Um, no offense to Bakersfield, but, um, it's not, it's not LA. 
Okay. It may be near LA. It's not LA. Um, and Bakersfield so, is its own community. Let's say that. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so should YouTube have taken it down? I mean, they, they have a policy. I looked at their policy. Obviously you can't put things on there that are like, uh, you know, hate speech, bullying, you know, bullying or nudity. Um, things that you know uh, like no scams like that what they did is not is not a direct scam they weren't like hey you know come open up and i mean maybe maybe people would see that as a scam so what whether they have any liability mm, nope i don't i don't, I don't I, they may have, yeah yeah it's it but depends on who which which side you're arguing so you know when i hear you speak i'm like oh you it makes it seem like they're were out for their pockets. They're trying to get more, you know, their business to open up. Um, by the way, I've heard from other law firms um, regarding, you know, these some of these businesses that are opening up. They're getting some of them are getting fines. Um, whether or not that's going to be prosecuted is another story. Fine. They're um, getting fined for what? Opening for before Newsom's order is, you know, taken away. Is that what you mean? Yeah, it's more of the local orders. Um, Newsom just said that you, you know, he he it's he didn't really issue the order. He said, yes, stay. We it's you're safer at home. And um, but then it was the L.A. County um, that came out with this uh, again, another order or it was a policy really to stay at home and then they gave like criteria for leaving and if you're an essential business. So I'm mostly looking at, you know, clients with essential businesses yeah. and, um, you know, for opening up, are they adhering to those rules? So if I had a client, because that if they not, don't, they could get fined by the right. city, for example, it's not okay. just a fine by a city. It's, it's liability by a patron or the employee. So they definitely want to institute those. So, 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 so meaning if somebody got sick and they alleged that they got it at, your Starbucks, for example, that place could potentially be liable for whatever happens. Is that well? There, well, they would want to have that defense of we we follow OSHA, we follow the CDC guidelines, we follow the county, we did everything yeah. that we we're supposed to do. So then, um, it, again, I said earlier, it's very fact specific. So there would be evidence, there'd be you know all that goes you know all through the whole lawsuit process during discovery. So. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, you know, how these claims are going to come out. I'm not really sure. But as far as those doctors, um, what their their urgent care, the urgent care center is is an essential business. I would argue it is. It's medical care. If you get it, if you need stitches, you need to go to their, you know, their urgent care center. I think urgent um, cares are still legitimately open. Yeah. Right. Right. But people aren't going because here's the thing. Because I know doctors who work at or own these. And when people aren't driving around and they're not playing sports, and they're they're not going to the urgent care, right? Why? That's how a lot of injuries occur, right? Car accidents. Um, but now everyone's at home, and probably there's there's just less business for them. But um, so I don't know if they had a slant to well open up all businesses, get people on the road so they'll be in our urgent care center. I don't know. But as far as other businesses like hair salons or restaurants that are not supposed to be open they're not considered essential businesses they're getting fine or they're getting they're getting the uh you know um the penalties like you know tickets almost for yeah. being open and so whether or not those will actually be prosecuted is another story i'm just not sure i'm not definitely don't rely on this and open if you open up your business you could have to pay the thousand dollar fine it is it is um uh actually written that this is considered a penalty misdemeanor misdemeanor and and also every Wait, what locality, say that again if you open and you're not an essential business then if you it's a thousand dollar fine and it's continued you said considered a misdemeanor um that is, that is you said? LA, that's the la city wow. and that um they're just saying look you, you need to stay at home if you don't stay at home then your exception is you're going for um, you're going to work for essential businesses. Those businesses have actually given their employees some of them letters to state that this this employee is on you know is working, and so in case they were to get pulled over or get otherwise get in trouble, um, some of them have arguments of why this is a medically you know essential type of treatment yeah. that they've conferred with their counsel about. Um, but when when you have people who are 
clearly not one of these 16 critical in or 17, however many it is now, critical industries like manufacturing and healthcare and food, yeah. then um, you would be potentially in defiance of the order and then you could get cit a citation of a thousand dollar fine. And so whether or not those will be prosecuted or, you know, what's going to happen with that where we're just not sure. Some of the other law firm, I haven't been retained to deal with that yet, but it, I'm sure I will be as you know, the longer that we are on quarantine or lockdown, however you want to, um, define yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. More businesses are going to want to open up for sure. And in fact, Garcetti, um, or, I'm sorry, Gavin Newsom just said today, right before our video that now some retail will be able to open on Friday. So oh, wow. like, before the May 15th, but I looked at it. It seemed to me like everything that was available, I could buy at Target. So, uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> which has been open. So like books, the florists, bookstores, florists, clothing, you know, not so that I shop. Clothing at retail is going to open up Friday in California. Is that what you said? He, that's what he seemed to indicate during oh, his wow. press conference. Okay. Yeah. I haven't been paying attention to that. But I'm again, you can only open you can only open if you are um, enabling social distancing. Right. You offer the hand sanitizing and hand washing. I uh, see. The gear, you know, protective gear, stuff like that. I see. If you follow, if you play by the rules, here's the rules to reopening. Got right. It. So the non so the other businesses that still are like in the shadows, wanting to open up, need to make the case that they could follow those rules as well. Yeah, it makes sense. And and listen, about this Bakersfield thing, I think that we do need to reopen stuff for the sake of business and do it in a very cautious, calculated, you know, scientifically evidence-based way to minimize the body count from this thing. Not oh, this is no big deal, let's open it up and run wild. And also having a, a plan of, you know, contact tracing, chasing people down who are sick and keeping them at home and that whole thing, you know. So we will see because it's happening. I just, you know, I worry about people dying, <laughs> the sick and old dying because it's going to happen. You know? Right. I have mixed views. I prefer not to express my personal opinion about all of this on the video. But Suzanne, I love your disclaimers. They make me happy. <laughs> You're such a lawyer. Yes. Well, hey, this was really talk. good. Great. Yeah, exactly. And um, I learned a lot from having this conversation. And we'll have to get to contact tracing and other stuff next time because I, I have my opinion on that as well. Legal. Yeah, we should, we yeah. should do it again. I appreciate you for weighing in on all the, the legal spots of this. You know, we should do kind of a uh, some kind of question and answer thing to, to generate some question, like a like an Instagram Live or a Facebook Live so we can generate some questions for the next one. But Suzanne, thank you for sharing your expertise. Um, tell people again where they can find you if you want people to reach out or if they have business questions if they have a business you may be able to help how can they contact you i really like my email because it's very simple it's no, just no 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 i don't know do we want to give an email do you have a website uh well the website has my email the web i mean it doesn't matter they can go to solve and win com and it's, it's going to have my, my email. Um, they can go to my linkedin profile as well it, it lists i'm partner of a lion as well and um you can email me at that firm. I have an I'm email, so, but I, I'm so what? surprised. I'm, I mean, I'm not going to stop you from giving your email. No, I've never had an interview with somebody where they want to give their email. But if if you want to put that out there publicly, have at it. I don't. I'm not going to. I'm sorry to stop you. Uh, well, I just mm -hmm. it's on the website, so they're going to end up if they okay. wanted to contact. All I'm saying is I'd rather get an email versus uh, it's easier to get a hold of me because uh, you know they don't want the phone ringing off the hook. So email me. Um, yeah, it's just my name, Suzanne, S-U-Z-A-N-N-E, -N -N -E, at lawyer.com, L-A-W-Y-E-R.com. It's very simple. I do not own the domain of lawyer.com, but I own others. So that's it. Thanks for doing this, Suzanne. It was fun. <laughs> You're very welcome, Larry. Take Thank care you of me. yourself. Stay safe and all quarantined. And thanks for your work with you know businesses and 
hoping people get through this legally. You're welcome. Yeah, this was great. Okay, have a good evening. Bye. Bye.